And then I will show my screen here. All right, so today what I'd like to do is really go over some properties of sets by going over some kind of not so well-known ideas, things like what is called the Cantor's diagonalization argument, and then also some ideas from Bertrand Russell that will give us some paradoxes. But I figured that this would be a good way to kind of wrap up the course. We're gonna book in a lot of ideas that we started the course with at the very beginning. But first, let's do some quick announcements here. Um, remember that Friday's lesson is now on YouTube, so hopefully you can download a copy there or just take a look at what's happening. I'll also have office hours at the usual time, usual place, so after class today at 11, and then this afternoon at 4 p.m. Uh, we still have the mentor sessions going on, so Sundays, Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays from six to eight. And as a reminder, we really only have one more assignment you have to quote unquote churn in. This will be problem set number six that we're going to present in class on Wednesday. So please try to be ready to present your solutions to the problems on Wednesday. That's all that we're gonna do there in class. Also, just a quick reminder about the second midterm versus the final presentations. Um, you do have the option of doing either or, so either the second midterm or giving a final presentation. The exam I plan to post online on Friday and that'll be due by Monday. If you need more time, anything comes up, I'm happy to be laid back about it. So don't feel stressed and locked in like you have to get it done within a couple of days. And I'm happy to be as flexible as, as you need me to be. Um, for the presentations, remember that I am asking that you choose a topic. Please get that to me as soon as possible so that I can go ahead and try to figure out the schedule for next week if we are going to give any presentations. There's a list of some of the topics here on the screen. If you wanted to go over any of these topics in detail, send me an email, stop by for office hours. I'm more than happy to chat about all of these. And of course, if you do decide to get to do both of these, then you will receive extra credit. So any questions here on any of the assignments that are due, including here the midterms and the presentation? So I do plan on doing a review for the midterm on Friday. So I certainly am happy to kind of pass out a review packet and then also go over some, um, some concepts on Friday. Right. Let's see, one more person has joined in. All right. So let's do a recap then of where we were last week. Right, let's start with the complete order field F. And really there were only three main results of what we went over. So first we said, let's take a look at the collection of all continuous functions. So this is what I called here C0, right? Set of all continuous functions that go from I to F, or right? our closed interval I to our complete order field F. Then we proved, at least we sketched the proof that this here forms a commutative ring and I would say, don't worry about all of that fancy language. We don't need that. Simple thing you need to know is that if f and g are continuous functions, then the sum is a continuous function and the product is a continuous function. Right, that was the main thing. So again, if you're given two continuous functions, f and g, their sum is continuous and their product is continuous. Right, that's the main thing to note here from this result. Second key result is that every polynomial is a continuous function. All right, so if you write out a polynomial here in terms of sums of powers of x, where the coefficients a sub k lie in the original field f, then remember that we proved by induction that every polynomial is a continuous function. And kind of as an extreme to this, we actually prove that there is a function that is discontinuous everywhere. So let's take a function f that does this weird thing. It's one whenever x is rational and it takes on the value zero whenever x is irrational. 
then we prove that this is a discontinuous function. And here the idea is that we're using the fact that both the rationals and the irrationals are dense in the real numbers. Like that's how we got this to work that here we have to have um, a discontinuous function. So these were the three main ideas from last time. So any, any questions on these? So remember that today, I want to try to wrap things up, but I want to try to put everything back together. So let me start with really two very simple motivating questions. Number one, what is a set? All right, if you really notice here in this class, we haven't really talked about what a set is, but I do want to go over some examples in just a minute. And number two, the question is, how do we determine how large a set is? So for example, how large are the integers? How large are the real numbers? You know, we haven't really talked about any of these things yet. We worried a lot about constructing the real numbers, but we never talked about how large they are. So these are two questions that I wanna spend time today going over to see if we can maybe answer one way or the other. So let's just start with just some basic examples so that we can kind of make sure we're on the same page here. All right, so just some simple examples of sets. So we could start here maybe with the empty set, right? Remember we started off the course by saying that the empty set here has no elements. So I'm putting this absolute value to, to ask how many elements does this set have? Right, similarly, we could talk about a singleton set. So that is, it's a set that has just one element, or we can maybe even talk about a set here that has three elements, right? So the absolute values here just remind us that the cardinality is three. Right, so these are all examples of sets, but of course here I only have just finitely many elements. So what if we move over to the power sets? So remember that the power sets was the set of subsets. So for example, what if we have the empty set itself? Then what's the power set of the empty set? Well, here kind of the weird thing is I have to ask, what are the subsets of the empty set? Well, the only subset of the empty set is the empty set itself. So here I would have this set. So if this is confusing. Remember that when you see these curly brackets, that's like a box. And then what's inside the P or the PQR, those are elements inside of a box. So you might think of, let's say this here is like a box that contains an apple, and this here might be a box that contains an apple, an orange, and a pear. Well, the first one here is just the empty box. Right? It's still a box. It's just nothing's inside of that box. Well, the fact that I have a box would be this here. Right? So this just says this here is the box. Well, now, what if I have, in this case, a box with an apple? Then the power set says that there's really two possibilities. I can either have a box with nothing in it, or a box with an apple in it, right? So these would be the two possibilities for the power set of the singleton set. So this here, we would have two elements, right? Similarly, if we kind of do this monster case here at the bottom, say we might have a box that has an apple, an orange, and a pear, then I have to ask, well, how many different subsets are there? Well, I can just have the box itself, I can have the box with an apple, the box with an orange, the box with the pear, the box with an apple and an orange, with an apple and a pear, with an orange and a pear, or I can have the box with all three. All right, so we know now that there will be eight different ways in which we can combine all of these together. All right, so any questions here on how we did the power set of a set? All right, so just remember that we started the course by talking about power sets of sets. So here will be some examples here. Now let me make a couple of observations about these. First, notice that A is always a subset of itself. Right, so I can think of A as a subset of itself, but that's the same thing as saying that A is contained in the power set, right? Like you can actually see this here, right? A is in the power set. 
Similarly here, A is in the power set. Here, A is in the power set. But now this notation you want to be very careful about. A is not an element of itself. It is a subset of itself, but it's not an element of itself. Right, so there's a slight difference in how we're doing things here. This here, remember that A, this is asking if I have a box with things in it, does that kind of look like the configuration of a box with things in it? This here might ask something like, well, do I have a box sitting inside of this box of things? Right, so, so I just want to point out that saying that A is a subset of A is fundamentally very different than saying A is an element of A. Okay, so any questions up to this point? All right. Now, there's another way you can think of sets. And this is when you have the natural numbers and then even sequences. So we know, for example, that the natural numbers, we can write that as this set over here. It's the number starting with one and then increasing from there. So now we can think of a sequence in this way here. They're gonna be indexed by maybe the natural numbers, right? So like A1, A2, AN, so on and so forth. So now let's write down a function. So this function takes an integer n and it gives me an element AN in my sequence. So I can really think of this as this fancy word here, correspondence, right? So this just says that I have a way to correspond this natural number n to the nth element here on the sequence. All right, so I'm gonna use this word here a lot today, this idea of a correspondence. It just says that I should be able to go from one set over here to the other set over here. Okay. So here are a couple of questions I want you to keep in mind as we move on today. So how does the power set of the natural numbers compared to the natural numbers. Right? Like in all of these examples, I see here that I have some set A, I then have here the power set. But now what I wanna know is what if I actually work with the natural numbers? So what does it mean to say the power set of the natural numbers? And similarly, how does the power set of the natural numbers maybe compare to the real numbers? You know, we've been studying real numbers here throughout the course, but we never talked about how power sets, the naturals and the reals are all related to each other. So th this is what I wanna talk about today. How are these three all related? Okay, all right. So a lot of what I'm gonna say actually comes from a, um, some ideas of a German mathematician named Georg Cantor. And a lot of these ideas, um, you might see them in other branches in analysis such as the Cantor set, Today we're gonna to talk about what's called the Cantor diagonalization argument, but these are all really ideas that Cantor put forth, I'll say roughly the mid to late 1800s or so. So, so a lot of when I say Cantor, I just want you to kind of keep in mind, this is the individual that, that I'm referring to, okay? All right, so let's start with the celebrated theorem of Cantor, and first let me set it up in the following way. Remember that the power set is the set of subsets. And we actually proved this is one of the very, very first things here in the course, we proved this by induction, that if A has n elements, then the power set has two to the n elements. Right, that was kind of that, that pattern that we saw before. So this is the general pattern. If A has n elements, then power set of A has two to the n elements. And actually, this was a homework problem that you had the number of elements in A is strictly less than the number of elements in the power set, right? That is N is always less than, never equal to, two to the N, right? So we proved that this is true for any finite set. Cantor actually proved that the same thing is true if you have an infinite set. So I wanna explain how this argument works because you just can't simply say, well, let n go to infinity because then infinity equals to infinity and then something's not really right. So, so this argument here is gonna be very subtle in terms of what it's saying. All right, so Cantor proved in 1891 the following. For any set, it doesn't matter if your set is finite or infinite, 
the set of subsets has strictly greater cardinality than A itself. If you want to know what that means, it's exactly the statement here. So again, it says that the size of A is strictly less than, never equal to, strictly less than the size of the power set. But again, I'm saying here that this works even if A is an infinite set. So we have to be a little bit careful as to what this really means. And this is the whole point of the proof is that it really makes rigorous what all of these words mean. Great, so let's try to do the proof in the following way. I wanna do a proof by contradiction. So what I mean is, let's say that A and this power set have the same cardinality. Now that's fancy words of saying that there is some map where I can associate an element of my set A to a subset in P of A and vice versa, right? So there has to be a one-to-one -one correspondence. So if you give me an element in A, I give you back a subset, you give me back a subset, I give you back an element in A, right? They have to match up one-to-one. -one. Now, of course, we already know by looking at some previous examples, when A is a finite set, we cannot do this. Remember something like if A here has three elements, the power set of A has eight elements. And there's no way I can match up the three elements in A with the eight elements in the power set of A. Right, again, when A is finite, I can't do this. I can't match them up in a one-on-one -on -one way. The one over here on the right is much, much larger than the one over here on the left. So, we're gonna do a proof by contradiction by assuming that we can do this. And notice that it doesn't matter whether A and the power set are infinite sets. What I'm saying is that there is no way I can match up in the one-to-one -one way what's in the set A with the power set of A. Okay, so does everybody follow what we're gonna to try to do here? Okay, so here's where I want you to be very careful as to the notation. This map says it will assign to every element in A, a lowercase a in A, a subset f of A. Right, so again, give, if you give me an element lowercase a, I will give you back a subset f of A. But that's gonna be the way that I'll try to have this one-to-one -one association, right? An element over here in A, with a subset in the power set of A. Of course, again, the contradiction says that I shouldn't be able to do this, but let's say for the moment, maybe we can. Let me write down the following. This here is the set of elements in the set A, such that lowercase a is not an element of F of A. Right, now, where we have to be a little bit careful is remember that f of a is a set. It is a subset. So I can make sense of this. Lowercase a is an element. f of a is a subset. So I can ask, is lowercase a an element of f of a? Right, so, so I'll let you kind of stare at this for a minute, but th this is supposed to look really weird. I mean, this is the whole concept of a proof by contradiction you write down something weird enough that everything falls apart. All right, so again, lowercase a is an element of my set A. F of A is some subset. So now I'm gonna form the set B and then say, only look at the elements, lowercase a, that are not in F of A. So here's gonna be the question is B in the image of the set F. So here's what I mean. B is a subset of A, right? Because it's the set of elements satisfying some property. So B is a subset of A. But now B, because remember that here I have a one-to-one -one correspondence, everything in the power set has to come from some element in A, right? That's what it says. I have a one-to-one -one correspondence, so that means I can match them up one by one by one. So if I have something in P of A, that better come from something in A. 
So let's assume that this really is the case. All right, so this is gonna be our proof by contradiction. So if it comes from F, then this means that it looks like it's in the form F of A for some A and capital A, right? Because again, I'm assuming that here I have this correspondence. So I have some element B from the power set that better come from some A over here in the set A. Okay. So, so do you have any questions so far before we go on? Because I know this is kind of a weird concept here. Okay, so again, we know that B here is a subset, has to come from some element. Now I'm gonna ask a question. Is this element lowercase a in B or is it not? So here's where the contradiction comes in. Let's assume that A is an element of B. Then A is an element of F of A. And so by the way that we've constructed B, a is not an element of B. Okay, okay let, me, let me back up and say that one more time. I have two cases. Either A is an element of B or it's not. If A is an element of B, this is the first case. Then remember that B equals F of A. So then A is an element of F of A. But now let me come back to the definition of what it means to be in B. Well, then this means that A is not in B. So if A were an element of B, then we conclude that A is not an element of B. That's a contradiction. Right, that, that makes no sense. So now let's take a look at the other case, right? Let's say, what if A is not an element of B? Well, because B is F of A for some A, then this means that A is not an element of F of A, but now I'll go back to the definition of B, and this means that A is an element of B, which is again, a contradiction. So what we've contradicted, or what we've concluded now is this here. B is not in the image of F. So I've constructed now a set over here in the power set that does not match up to an element A in A. So this is why the cardinality is strictly greater, right? Because it says that here, I've just constructed a set that can't come from A. So this argument here has a name. This is what's typically called Cantor's diagonal argument. And I'm gonna come back and say more about this in just a moment, right? But for the moment, this is what's typically called the diagonal argument, All right? If you wonder where diagonal comes from, it's this thing here. Okay. All right, so questions so far on how we did this first weird statement. Okay, all right, let's try to move on here. So let me give an application of this. Um, although ironically, Cantor proved this before, he proved that previous result in 1891, but he proved the following result in 1874, right? So it's a little bit of um, an anachronism, but still what I'm going to say kind of matches up with what I had before. I'm going to show two things. Number one, the real numbers is an uncountable set. Really, that's kind of a weird statement. So what I actually mean by that is the cardinality of the real numbers is strictly greater than the cardinality of the natural numbers. So I'm gonna to try to use something very similar to before to do this, right? So remember that before we had this whole thing of like that the power set has cardinality larger than any set A. So it's gonna be the same idea here. So I'm actually gonna prove that the cardinality of R is strictly greater than the cardinality of the natural numbers. Okay. 
All right. So what we're going to do is show that I can actually match up the real numbers with the power set of the natural numbers. So if you give me a real number, I can write down a power set. You give me back a power, you give me a power set, I can write down a real number. So I'm explicitly going to give you a one-to-one -one correspondence with these two. Okay. All right. Now, if I could show this, I just got finished showing that there is no correspondence between the natural numbers and the power set. Right, that was Cantor's argument from 1891. There is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the natural numbers and the power set of the natural numbers. So there is no correspondence between the natural numbers and the real numbers. That's exactly what it means to be an uncountable set. Right, so again, the definition of uncountable means there is no way that I can match up in the one-to-one -one way a natural number with the real number. Right, so that, that's what we're going to prove here. And again, the way that we'll prove that is by showing that there is a correspondence between the real numbers and the power set of the natural numbers. Okay, all right, so are the questions on how we're gonna do this proof here? Okay, all right, let's keep going here. So I'm going to do this in a series of steps to kind of get the maps to work out. So it's a little bit difficult to kind of just go directly from reals to the power sets. So we'll do this as follows. First, I claim that I can take the set of real numbers and I can shrink it so that it's the open interval from zero to one. All right, so I can take this long infinite set of real numbers and I can shrink it so that it's only the interval from zero to one. And the way you basically do that is by using the logarithm. So if you give me any real number from zero to one, sorry, any real number at all, let's call that X, I will compute this number Y. And Y is the number between zero and one. All right, so for example, let's, let, let's pick the number X to be um, zero. Well, then I'm going to let Y here be one half. So again, pick any real number X that you want, then I'll choose Y to be this number between zero and one. Conversely, pick any number Y between zero and one, then here's a real number X. So now I'm gonna take the set of real numbers and let's shrink it to be this interval between zero and one in this way. Okay, so any questions on how we did this first step? All right, so that's the first of three. So now let's do the second step here. The second step is really weird. So I'm gonna to try to slow down for a little bit and explain this here. Next, I wanna take any real number from zero to one, and I wanna write that as a sequence of zeros and ones. So, Again, take any number between zero and one, and let's try to write that as a sequence of zeros and ones. And the way that we'll do this is as follows. Say that you give me a sequence of zeros and ones. So you could just take a computer and just say, just spit out at random, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, zero, zero. Just spit out any sequence of zeros and ones that you want. If you do that, I'm going to write down the following number here that is written, roughly speaking, dyadically. So here I write this as a sum. So let's say if the first number is a one, I would write one half. If the next number is a zero, I'd write zero over four. If the next number is a one, I'd write plus one over eight. So whenever I see an a sub n, I will add in an a n divided by two to the n. All right, so again, if you give me an infinite sequence of zeros and ones, I'm going to write down this real number between zero and one, All right? And it turns out that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence to do that. You give me a number between zero and one, I can write down a sequence of zeros and ones. You give me a sequence of zeros and ones, I can write down this number between zero and one, All right? So any real number between zero and one, 
corresponds to an infinite sequence of zeros and ones. And there is notation for that. It turns out that you have this really funny looking notation here, this zero one raised to the natural number power. That just means the sequence of zeros and ones. And in full disclosure, this isn't 100% rigorous. You have to be a little bit careful, but, but I'll say that if you want to see the rigorous argument, you can go here to the Wikipedia page, because I think that's a decent job. But I don't want to worry about the hardcore details. I just want to emphasize there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between numbers between zero and one and infinite sequences of sequences of zeros and ones. All right, so that's the second thing. So now if you give me any real number, I can write down an infinite sequence of zeros and ones. Okay, all right. So here's the last step. Now, give me any sequence of zeros and ones, and I'm going to write down a subset of the natural numbers. Okay, here's how we do this. Give me a subset of the natural numbers. So let's say maybe you tell me that subset is the number, it's just the set that consists of one, two, three. All right, so say that you just tell me that. It just consists of one, two, three. I'm gonna write down a sequence as follows. A sub one, I'll call one. A sub two, I will call one. A sub three, I'll call one. And everything else, I'll just call zero. So what the sequence does is, it says, if you were to give me a subset A, now consider just those numbers n where n appears in a. So if the natural number n appears, then put down a sub n is 1. If the natural number 1 n does not appear in a, put down 0. So the sequence here kind of keeps track of whether an integer appears in the set or not. Right, so for example, if A here maybe consists of all of the odd numbers, so one, three, five, seven, then the sequence over here will just be one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Right, it will just alternate between one and zeros. If the subset over here consists of all even numbers, the sequence over here will be zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. Right, so again, the A sub N here just tells me whether the number N appears in my set A. Right. So this now allows me to go from any sequence of zeros and ones to any subset of the natural numbers. Okay. Okay, any questions here on this last one? All right, so now just put all three of them together. So you have the first map that says for any real number, I have a number between zero and one. The second map says, give me any number between zero and one, write down a sequence. The third one says, give me any sequence of zeros and ones, write down a subset. So there's my one-to-one -one map, right? Because for each of these arrows, I, I can tell you how to go back and forth. Okay, all right, so. Any questions here? Okay, let me just quickly say that Cantor's diagonal argument, you, so many of you may have seen this before. What I've really written out here is very similar to kind of the following picture. So what you would say is something to this effect. Um, the way that you prove that there is no correspondence between the natural numbers and the real numbers is you do something like this. Let's assume that there is such a correspondence. Well, that corresponds to that map F that I talked about before. So that says now, if you were to give me maybe a natural number N, then maybe I can write out the sequence. So this, this is now like a sequence of zeros and ones. If you give me the number two, maybe I can write out another sequence of zeros and ones. So as you kind of give me different numbers N, maybe now I can write out more and more sequences of zeros and ones. So what Cantor's diagonal argument says is, actually, if I did this here, if I looked at this diagonal and constructed now the following sequence of zeros and ones, 
it does not appear in this list. So here now I've actually constructed a sequence of zeros and ones that cannot come from this list here. And that this is almost exactly the same as what I wrote down before asking this question, is A an element of F of A? Right, it's almost exactly the same. So for the sake of time, I'm not gonna worry about the details, I'm just pointing out that this is why we call it the diagonal argument, because this question of is A an element of F of A is exactly the same thing as kind of constructing a sequence here that can't be in the list that you just wrote out before. Okay, okay so let's recap. What, what is it that we've just done? So remember that that theorem from 1891, Cantor's theorem says, for any set, we know that we have one of two cases. So either S is finite or it's infinite, in which case we know that we can't have a correspondence for the power set. So let's be a little bit careful. For any set S, we'll say if we have a surjective map, so this just means that I can say that every element of S comes from at least one element from the natural numbers, at least one. It might be more than one, but at least one, then we'll say that our set S is countable. Well, in the case where S is a finite set, this is an example of a countable set. In the case where S is an infinite set, then saying that I have a one-to-one -one correspondence is what it means to be countable. And in this case, we use the symbol here. So in this case, then we'll say that the cardinality of S is aleph naught. Right, that's just the definition. All right, so again, if I have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the natural numbers and my set S, then I'll say that the cardinality of S is aleph naught. Right, so this here is a Hebrew symbol. Okay. All right, so that's one of our definitions. So I'm not going to have time to do this today. But I'll simply say that you can show that both the integers and the rational numbers are countable. And actually, I have the following cardinalities. This says that the natural numbers, the integers, and the rational numbers all have cardinality aleph naught. All right, so there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the integers and the natural numbers between the rational numbers and the natural numbers, right? This is what the symbol here means, right? There is a one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay. Now, Cantor's theorem says that the cardinality of the power set of the natural numbers is strictly greater than those for the natural numbers. But actually what we've shown is that the cardinality of the real numbers is the same as that for the power set of the natural numbers. So we've actually shown that R is uncountable. Right? There is no one-to-one -one correspondence. It's uncountable. And because we have the statement here about the power set, we actually have this here. The cardinality of R, of the real numbers, is 2 to the A of naught, which is just what we're gonna call aleph sub one. Right, so again, this here is the cardinality of the real numbers. That's what we're calling aleph sub one. Okay. So here's a weird concept. There's something in math that's called the continuum hypothesis. And in this case, it asserts there is no set S that has cardinality larger than A of naught, but smaller than A of one. Now this should look weird because the point is that everything that you see here is infinite. So notice that I'm not saying that the cardinality of S is not infinite. What the actually says is that there are different sizes of infinity. Right, so aleph naught is the infinity corresponding to the natural numbers. Aleph one is the cardinality corresponding to the real numbers. So this actually says, if I have any set 
that is not countable, but not quite as large as the real numbers, that set can exist, right? In a sense, there is no set that has cardinality in between the natural numbers and the real numbers, right? So this, this is a very strange concept, and, and this is still an open conjecture to this day, right? No, no one knows how to prove this. So I wanna emphasize that this statement here about infinities actually gets even worse than that. So remember I said you could take a look at the power set of the natural numbers, but what's to stop me from looking at the power set of the power set of the natural numbers? So now you have this really weird concept. So this actually says that there are infinitely many types of infinities. Yeah, so there's a question here about whether this is um, proven to be on what independent of the Zermelo Franco um, postulates. That, that is true. Um, I, remember, I don't remember exactly kind of the status of exactly what you need to assume here, but um, it's an open conjecture in the sense of um, th there's all these weird statements about what you have to assume to make these certain statements. And so I'll just kind of ignore it for now for saying that it, it's very complicated in the sense of some of the different terminologies here and, and what's what, right? But at the very least, what I'll say is that in the sense of the existence of a set, that's, that's still an open question. What you need to prove it is, is in a sense what's, what's already been done. Okay, all right, so again, you could say now, instead of the power set of the natural numbers, look at the power set of the power set of the natural numbers. You'll see that there are lots and lots and lots of infinities now. Now it gets really horrendous. So I can define a new symbol ellipse sub two to be the cardinality of the power set of the power set of the natural numbers. And now you can see in general, I can define a whole sequence of these ellipse by looking at the cardinality of the power set of things. So there is a corresponding generalized continuum hypothesis based on kind of these new um, ELIF numbers, which I'm not gonna focus on today at all. Okay, so if anything, I want you to take home from this slide that there are infinitely many sizes of infinities. Right? It's, it's a really weird concept, but you can make this rigorous by looking at the power sets of these things. Right. Okay, so I wanna spend the last few minutes or so kind of going over a very specific application of this for computer science. And I may not have enough time to go over this in detail, so I'll try my best. This is really based off of a series of ideas by Bertrand Russell, who was actually a really fascinating character. He was a mathematician and a logician, but actually he got the Nobel Prize in literature at one point for, for his writings. So he's considered to be very, very influential when it comes to understanding, say, different ideas and in logic and mathematics. Okay, so I want you to consider the following statement, which is gonna be very similar to what we just did a little while ago. And what I'm gonna show you here really should hopefully shock you to your core, because for a lot of mathematicians, they did exactly that. It said basically sets don't exist. So another way to state this is saying that Naive set theory, as originally created by Cantor himself, leads to a contradiction. But the rough explanation, the rough statement here is that sets don't exist. So if you don't believe me, this is Russell's argument. Let X be the set of all sets. So take whatever definition you want to use for a set, doesn't matter, we can all take whatever we want to think of here for this class, put everything together into one big set. So again, the set of all sets. So you may want to think of like those power sets of the real numbers and the power set of the power sets of the real numbers. Take all of those together, everything, put them into one huge set. Let me now consider the following set. So this is the set of sets that are not elements of themselves. So you may remember that at the very start of the lesson, I wrote down a set that is not an element of itself. So we know that there are examples of such sets. 
So my question now is B a set? So for the sake of time, I'm not gonna worry about going over this, but you'll see that you'll run into a problem in either way, exactly the way that we did for Cantor's diagonalization argument. Well, if B is an element of itself, then you'll see here that I have this contradiction. So then B is not an element of itself. If B is not an element of itself, then according to the statement here, then B is an element of itself. All right, so this is almost the same as Cantor's diagonalization argument, almost exactly the same. Well, this is a serious problem because now if I try to define sets, I've just written down a set that can't exist. So there actually is a way around this. Nowadays, people in math call this category theory and category theory is kind of a fancy way of getting around exactly this problem here. What I'll quickly say is that in no math book will they formally define a set because roughly speaking, there is no way to define a set. So what you do is that you can't consider this here. The set of all sets is too big. It's too big because you run into a contradiction here. So instead you work with the category of a certain object. So most textbooks, they kind of get around it by either not discussing what a set is, or they say something like, consider the set of matrices or consider the set of real numbers. But they, they kind of do this fancy way of getting around it by not looking at the set of all sets. They look at a smaller set of sets, which is nowadays what's called a category, right? But I just wanted to quickly point out that this idea of set theory actually runs into some very serious problems. And unfortunately, there's really no way you can get around this. You actually have to kind of do away with naive set theory and then look at a very fancy way of doing set theory which is category theory. Okay, any questions up to this point? All right. Okay, well, I think I'm gonna call it a day then. Um, I had actually hoped to get into some interesting idea about Turing machines, but maybe I'll just leave these for the lecture notes because it's already three minutes after and I definitely don't wanna run over by trying to introduce a whole bunch of new material here. Um, but I'll just hopefully pique your interest by saying you can also use this idea of Russell's paradox to prove you can actually write a computer program that a computer cannot do. And it actually doesn't matter if you have a computer that can run as fast as you want or that a computer has the largest hard drive or the most memory that you can possibly give it. You can actually write a computer program that a computer cannot do. And this was something that Turing had actually worked out himself back in about the 1940s or so. So, so if you want to see how to do this, then this is actually here in the slides and I'll be happy to, to chat with you about it later. Right. But if there's no other questions, then let's call it a day then. So I'll be around for office hours in case you do have any questions. All right. Okay, well, you all have a good rest of the day. So see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.